I'm going to ask you just to join me as we look at a very, it's a, it's a sensitive subject, but it's an important subject that you and I need to be challenged on. Because Jonah reflects an image of what we fall trapped to at times. There are times I want to get even. There are times that I don't want that person to be forgiven. And my worldview of God gets so small it gets ugly. And I don't like to look at that, but Jonah's a great story to remind me, hey, God loves people a lot more than I ever will. And I'm one of those that is loved by God in spite of what others think of me. And that's a really cool thought. So let's look at that as we're invited to the altar. I just ask you to join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, I, I thank you for the power of your scripture. I thank you that people decided to canonize Jonah's story and include it in the Holy Word. A little short story about an incredible prophet that was so real and human. And yet you loved him in spite of his reaction. And so as we do that and we wrestle with that same thought, Lord, don't guilt us. And I know you don't want to do that, but, but we fall prey. So in Jesus' name, I ask that we don't fall victim to the evil one guilting us today. But we just realize how much more love we can have with you. Help us realize we're scratching the surface. And if we come to this altar today, Lord, we're going to fall in love with you even greater than we do right now. It's not about guilt. It's about grace. And Jonah's going to point that out. So we just lift that up to you, Lord, and ask for the power of your Holy Spirit, inviting us to your altar. And I would ask, Lord, as I do so many times, but so graciously, let the words of my heart not be mine, but yours, Holy Spirit. Let it be your wisdom and your truth. I ask this graciously, humbly, but with expectation and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I do really want to say that I appreciate Dan Ziegler. I've gotten to know him over the years, and it's so nice to have him in our neighborhood. And I'm so grateful for social media as I listened to what he had to say last Sunday. He's a pretty sweet, sweet guy. He's got a lot of wisdom. And that camp... That he is out there leading our backyard, our, our, our place. A lot of lives get changed out there. I'm one of those lives that got changed out there. So I'm very grateful for him. But I want to talk again about Jonah today and, and Jonah's story. And, and this is kind of a, a sad part of Jonah. You know, if the story of Jonah ended when he you know, ran from God because he didn't want to go to Nineveh, because he didn't want to preach to them, because he knew God would love them in spite of his feelings for them. And, and he ran from God, and he got on this boat, and he sailed into the Mediterranean, and God said, you're running from me, you need to do my purpose, my will, because it's always best, and there's a lot of truth to that, every bit of that is true. And, and the storm comes up, and Jonah goes into the sea, and the whale swallows him, and, and then he gets spit out, vomited out on the sea in the Mediterranean, and he goes and does God's will, and the story ended. It just ended there. Wouldn't that be a great story? We'd be like, oh, that's so neat. You know, we can run from God, and I don't know if I want to be swallowed by a whale. That just doesn't make good sense to me. I, I, the smell alone would kind of mess me up. But, but I, I, you know, I run from God, and, and I get saved by God, and, and God redirects me back to where I need to be, and, and I'm happy, and the story ends. But that's not how Jonah ends. There's a whole other a couple of chapters that are not good. Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he preaches with sincerity. He tells them that God is a loving God, and, and we are people now on this side of Easter, on this side of the resurrection, and we know that. And we're like, yeah, no matter what I did, I can't run from God's grace. There's nothing that outdoes God's grace in spite of what other people might uh, drill into me and, and mislead me and deceive me. God's always loving me. And Jonah knew that because he's a prophet. He's a man of God. He knew that these Ninevites would be forgiven. And you got to understand, if you don't remember a couple of weeks ago, the Ninevites were, were ugly people to the border towns of Israel. Really ugly people. They were at war with Israel. And they would go into the border towns and they would take what they wanted. And they would kill the young men. And they would do harmful things to the women. You can let your imagination fill in the blanks. And then they would take the goods and they would go back to Nineveh. This is not a place you want to go and preach the forgiveness of God. 
This is a place you want to go and preach the wrath of God. And, and the reality is, this is hard to say because I don't like it. But it's what the church is like today. And I'm not just, this isn't about pinpointing Grace Church. It's the Christian church. We are not filling up because people are always saying, I don't want to go to a church. I don't want to go to a Christian church. All those people there, they're judgmental. And they all think that I'm a sinner. And I, just, I don't want to go there. If, if that's the view of the Christian church, I got great news for you today. I really do. You're in the right place. You're in the right place because that gets uncovered today. Sometimes the Christian church is like that log at the bottom of the wood pile. Uh, we had a fireplace when I was growing up, and I was always the one that had to go get the wood for the fireplace because we had a fire family nights, and we'd go and I'd go out and get the firewood, and, and I'd get down to the bottom of the pile. You know what I'm talking about? And, and the wood at the very bottom, it's been sitting there, it's dry, you know it's going to burn really well. It's going to be a nice fire. I love seeing big fires. And when you get down to the bottom and you pull that wood up and, and underneath it as daylight reveals the dirt that's underneath it, all the bugs and stuff have been living there and they all scatter because the daylight reveals it. That's what we're looking at, the image of the church sometimes. I don't like it. I don't want to preach it. I don't even want to point it out. But sometimes that's what it's like. We, we go into this community and, and they look at us and they're like the bugs. And they say, ah, what are you doing here? And I want to turn to them and say, the same reason you're here. I want to get saved. You should too. But that's what it's like. And Jonah just reflects that. You see, the problem is with Jonah, he's got this little wrapped up view of God. And God wants a world view of love and forgiveness. He wants a world view of grace. And so Jonah, he goes into this city in Nineveh. And there's a couple of interesting things that I want to point out that I've learned over the last number of years about this. I don't know if it's true. Scholars believe it's true. There's evidence of historical documentation that point this out. But just before Jonah went into the great city of Nineveh, they had two seasons of drought. And the drought, because of the lack of food in Nineveh, that's why they were plundering the border towns of Israel so hard, too, because they wanted food. But the drought and the lack of food, food brought plague to the city of Nineveh. So they lost a lot of people to disease and famine. They also think that there are records in other historical documents around Jonah's time of his preaching. And we just went through this. That's why I want to point it out. I didn't get to see it, but some of you got to see it in the full daylight of it. Uh, there was a solar, a full lunar eclipse just before Jonah went in to the city. And people didn't know how to read that lunar eclipse. That only happens once in a lifetime. Some of you got to see it. I saw the uh, pictures on Facebook. And, and they didn't know what to think. And in the midst of these two plagues, the lunar eclipse, Jonah comes into the city and he's sincere. Even though he doesn't want to be, he's sincere. That's a whole other message. How many times have we gone after God's will? We know what God's will is. We know we should forgive that person. And, and we want to be sincere because we love God. We understand what God did for us. But we just don't want to do it. But we're sincere because it's the right thing to do. And Jonah preaches the word of God. He marches through the city and calls them to repent. And all of a sudden... The king, even the king of Nineveh, chapter 3, I didn't have Faye read this, but chapter 3, verse 6, even the king of Nineveh says, Hey, this is our opportunity to get right with God. We have been plundering Israel for how many years since our drought and plague? We've seen this moon thing we don't know about, and we have a chance to say that we can save ourselves because the Israelites have shown us that God is real. And the king says, call a fast. He puts sackcloth on, and he sits in ashes, and he tells the people in Nineveh, take this real. Genuine. Genuine. Don't just take this as some sort of religious hocus pocus. Don't take this as a religious habit. This is real. And the whole city begins a revival. The whole city of Nineveh. This is a hundred, I'm not making this up, a couple hundred thousand people. There isn't a soul in that city that, that is left out. And genuineness of revival comes to God and they feel that forgiveness. And in spite of what Jonah's thinking, they feel that forgiveness. 
And they feel fresh. I don't know about you, but I can remember how many times in my life it started at Northern Pines with different experiences I've had right here in this church at this altar. Uh, different experiences I've had on retreat. Different experiences I've had in the woods or on the lake or in the mountains where I feel the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit is real. And I'm like, wow. I'm not denying this forgiveness I've had. And so they come to God, they repent, and God has a change of heart. When God saw what they did, Faye read this, uh, the, the last part of chapter 3, when God saw what they did, the genuineness of their repentance, when we come to the altar, the genuineness, and how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind. And I love that part too, by the way, because I always hear, well, God's so judgmental. God is not judgmental, man. Bad things happen to holy, righteous people, and our challenge is to believe in spite of that. And all of us can raise our hand and say, I hear you, I've been through that. God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now that'd be great if it ended there, right? If we didn't have chapter four, it'd be still a good ending. We'd be like, yeah, this is good. But unfortunately, there's Jonah's response. And that's not very good. Now we lift up that piece of wood at the bottom of the wood pile and we see the bugs just scatter. And Jonah responds and he just kicks his feet and he says, Great! I knew you'd do this, Lord. I knew that your love was greater than my love. I knew that you would not let them not get punished for everything they've done to the nation of Israel. I knew that you are so just, so merciful, so grace-filled, so loving. And now they're going to get away with it. They're going to get away with it. And you're going to forgive them. And I'm really not happy with that. Our view sometimes of God is so isolated, it's so little. I'm there too. I'm talking to me as much as you. I get so small in that view and I'm like, well, I know God loves me, but I'm not sure God really loves you right now. And God says, really? That's your view of my cross, Pastor Bob? That's how little it is? Do you not know that I love everyone? Do you not know that I love them as much as I love you? Yeah, but I don't like that. Well, that's okay. Now let's work with it and go from there. Because grace abounds. Let's move from there and start maturing. Listen to this conversation. It's so real. I love the God's word because God's word is always real. It's like exactly what I'm looking at. And so Jonah prayed to the Lord. Now, when he says pray, he's having, I don't know about you, but I have these conversations with God too. This is an interesting part, because this is a side note. But often, when we pray, we're mad at God for something. I'm serious, we are. I know I am. I know at times I'm like, really, God? You had to let that happen, didn't you? And God listens to us, and what I love about God is after I'm done being mad, God still loves me. He still loves me. And he says, it's okay, I understand you're venting, but I'm going to love you after you're done venting. And I'm not going to stop loving you, no matter what you do. He prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. This is why I totally went the other way. I knew you were going to be loving mercy. For I knew you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. It's like this guy knew God was going to forgive him. He's not a, he's not, he's a smart prophet. He's a genuine prophet. He knew when he preached it genuinely, these people were going to take it serious. Abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. We'll get there in just a bit, and Jonah says, I'd rather die. Can't you just hear God looking at, at Jonah and say, you'd rather die? Don't you remember when you were in the fish, Jonah? What if I would have let you die in that storm? What if I would have 
Remember that prayer, it's in chapter 2 of Jonah, that you wrote because I rescued you from that whale? I didn't let you die dead then. That was just a, a number of weeks ago. Months ago. Before you marched across the desert to Nineveh. And now you'd rather die? You know what the church really is like? I mean this. You know what I love about the church? I understand we're sinners. I understand I make mistakes. I understand this stuff happens. But you know what I love about the church? The people that have that, that bigger view of God are in the church. I'm so grateful for that. These are people that say, hey, I'm going to help with Sunday school. Does it take work? Yeah, it's going to take a commitment. And, and I don't want to be there some Sundays. And I don't want to do my lesson on Thursday night or Friday night or Saturday night. But I'm going to help because our kids need to find out about Christ. I'm going to help on Wednesday nights. I know it takes a lot of commitment. And I understand that. And I know that I, I'm going to have to give up some things. But I'm going to help because our kids, our youth, our young people, our children, they need that on Wednesday night. They want family on Wednesday night. They want a meal on Wednesday night. I want to be there. That's what the church is like. I'm going to help at the U Zone because there's kids who don't have a home to go to. And where can they find a home? They can find it at the U Zone. I'm going to be there. I'm going to help with the financial giving because that church needs to be there for our community so our community can find Christ. So I am going to help. I'm going to help with Houston. And I just want to throw this out. That this, instead of Jonah's response, we think of Houston and we see it. You know when they really need help? I'm not making this up. They need help about six months from now. Because six months from now, they're going to get financial aid, and they're going to have stuff ready to be rebuilt. I've done hurricane relief work in the Galveston area, and they're going to need help. And maybe instead of, and I'm not picking on our youth, I want our youth to go down there too, but instead of saying, well, let's just send our youth down there, maybe, maybe as adults, we could go down there and work a little bit. Maybe we could come in. I know a lot of relief organizations within the United Methodist Church in that area. Maybe we could say, hey, I want to give up some days. I want to go down there. It's just a thought. But then there's Jonah, isn't there? And he's sitting out there now after he had his conversation with God. And, and God said, you want to die? What about when I was in saving you from the belly of the fish, Jonah? What about then? You didn't want to die then. So, Joni, you already know what it's like to be saved. These people don't. And they can have that life now. They can have a life that is free of all the plundering and the death and the rape that they did to Israel. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than it is to live. And the Lord said back in prayer, Is it right for you to be angry? Is that right? What if I would have stayed angry when you were in that whale, Jonah? What if I would have stayed angry when you're going through that pain? What if I would have stayed angry when you were all upset and just begging for a sign from God? What if I would have stayed angry when you're upset with that work situation? And it worked itself out slowly, not soon enough, but I went through it with you. What if I stayed angry with you when you went through that divorce? And I stayed with you. And with you. And all of a sudden, we kind of get a glimpse of what the church can be as we're invited forward. And we are there. There's glimpses of ways we're there I see every day. Whether it be uh, Rally Sunday coming up, or whether it be just somewhere in the community or at the community food shelf or here at a small group in a prayer, whether it be at one of our other small groups at Hilltop or somewhere else or Faith and Fitness coming up, all of a sudden I see more than Jonah's response. You know, if you read chapter 4 this week for your quiet time, you can see his response. He goes and sits outside the city and he sulks because he knows they're going to be forgiven. And he just waits to see what God's going to do. And then God has another conversation with them as chapter 4 evolves and develops in the midst of his anger. That's an ugly place to be when we don't want to forgive. It's an ugly place. 
And I have been there a few times. I am not going to deny that. I have struggled with God and said, God, I know you forgive him, but I don't know if I want to forgive him. And God says, well, when you're ready, I'm going to be here for you when you forgive him too. And until you get there, Pastor Bob, I'm going to love you all the way there. And I'm going to keep loving you. Isn't that wonderful about God? That's the good news we get to come up to today. That's the beauty of the response to that. Even when I'm a little misfit, God says, I'm going to love you. And I'm not leaving you. A lot of people are going to because you're not really fun to be around right now. Because you're kind of a misfit. But I'm going to love you. And Jonah's sitting out there in that east wind and it's hot and he's mad and he's tired. God just throws a shade with him and takes it away and then comes back. I am not going to stop loving you. That's what the church is like. And that's why we're here. Because this is the one place that is more genuine love. And I think Dan talked about that last Sunday. More genuine love than anything can deliver. There's no politician that can deliver that. There's no other way to deliver that. Money can't buy that. This is it. We get to see it in Jonah today. And so as I invite us forward, I, I, I want to stop there, but I, I didn't want to stop there all the way. As I invite us forward, I want to pick a song that David Herzberg is going to play today. And it's a beautiful song. It's my hilltop, mighty to say. It's going to be played while we come up for communion. And... The song is called Mighty to Save. He's going to have it up there when we come forward for communion, come to the altar. And it's just the words. I, the words will be on the screen, so don't worry. But I want to just say them to you. The good news is you can all breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not going to sing them to you. That would be very good. Okay? Yeah, I hear you. I do. I hear you. <laughs> that would be ugly. But, but here is the words to this song. And it explains what Jonah needs to hear and what I need to hear. It's called Mighty to Save. It's by Hillsong United. Well, everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. But let mercy fall on me. Well, everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. And then the chorus, my Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, and now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Those are the words 